Hi, everyone. I wanted to welcome you to School Psych Podcast. We're getting back into the groove of things uh, with summer vacation just ending, so a lot of us are, are back in our office and dusting off all our supplies and everything. Um, we're going to talk a little bit with um, our awesome guest tonight and about his work and about his book, so we're going to get right into it. Um, first off, my name is Rachel, and I'm a school psychologist, and right now I'm working in the state of Maryland. Rebecca? Hi, I'm Rebecca. I'm a school psychologist working in the state of Connecticut. I want to remind you guys about how to participate because we'd love to hear your ideas, your thoughts, and your questions. You can comment right um, on the School Psych podcast page on Facebook or on School Psych Your School Psychologist or on Twitter using the hashtag Psyched Podcast. We look forward to hearing from you. Hope you're, hopefully you're out there. Anna. Hi, I'm Anna. I'm a school psychologist working in New York State. Um, I want to introduce our guest, Paul Toff. Um, Paul is the author of the most recent book he's written. It's called Helping Children Succeed, What Works and Why. Um, his previous book, How Children Succeed, Grit, Curiosity, and the Hidden Power of Character, was translated into 27 languages um, and spent more than a year on the New York Times hardcover and paperback bestseller lists. Paul has also written for New York Times Magazine and a whole bunch of other things. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Paul. Thank you. It's great to be here. Um, would you mind telling us just a little bit about your background? I would love to hear how you got interested in education. Sure. Um, so my, all the way back to my background, I'm originally from Canada, from Toronto, that's where I grew up, um, and moved to the United States to be a journalist in my uh, early 20s, uh, and spent a long time actually as a magazine editor, not as a writer, um, editing stories about all kinds of things. Uh, and then about 15 years ago, I moved to the New York Times Magazine as an editor uh, and started writing occasional articles with them. One of the first articles that I wrote was about um, a man named Jeffrey Canada and his organization, the Harlem Children's Zone. Uh, and that became a cover story in the Times Magazine way back in 2003. And that then became my first book. I ended up working for another five years uh, on that book. It became my, my first book, which is called Whatever It Takes. Uh, for Canada's quest to change Harlem in America. And that was really, you know, I, I sort of started off writing about it because I was interested in Jeff and thought his ideas were fascinating, but didn't think it was going to be something I was going to keep writing about for 13 years, as I have. Um, but the questions that came up in reporting in Harlem about um, why some kids succeed and why some don't, and what kind of interventions and support can help more kids succeed, those continue to be uh, fascinating and um, fascinating to me and feel very important in terms of um, our nation and its trajectory. Uh, and so I've just continued to follow uh, those questions in one form or another for the last uh, almost 15 years. Cool. So um, you wrote in Helping Children Succeed. You just did a ton of, ton of sounds like you spent a ton of time in schools with people and kids and teachers and educators and um, our audience is school psychologists. So usually there's maybe one of us in a school, maybe a psychologist has three or four schools. I've been in one school where there's two psychs in school. But you know, we have a presence in schools and we have an impact in giving those lovely IQ tests that you um, mentioned a little bit and also um, helping place kids in special education. But you talk about a lot more than where we come in, you know, as far as those two tasks, um, and so we kind of are always trying to improve school psych's role and have like a more broad impact and be proactive and preventative, so um, we kind of wanted to spread your findings to um, school psychs out there so they could kind of hear more about things that they could maybe be involved in and help out administration-wise and stuff like that. So um, would you mind describing the um, intervention models? like? You talk about changing the environment, those two intervention models that you found most motivating for kids who want to persevere through adversity and change? Sure. Uh, if it's okay, I'll just back up a little bit and talk about some of the, the findings in the book that I, I think sort of motivate my writing about interventions. Um, which is that, you know, a lot of what I'm, a lot of the focus of helping children succeed is kids who grow up in adversity. The question that I was trying to answer was how does uh, adversity poverty and other forms of adversity. How does that affect kids' development? Um, how does that affect how they do in school? And what kind of interventions, both inside and outside of school, can help children uh, do better in school? Uh, 
Um, and so a lot of what I write about is the, the science of adversity. Uh, is how growing up in difficult circumstances, and especially stressful circumstances, affects the way children develop. Um, and this is a subject we actually um, know a lot more about, uh, scientists know a lot more about than they did 10, 20, or 30 years ago. Uh, the way that our stress response systems develop, the way that growing up uh, in environments of intense stress, what doctors sometimes call toxic stress, can affect the development of that stress response system. Uh, make kids you know, amp up their, their fight or flight response, make it more difficult for them to concentrate, to react well to criticism or setbacks. Um, and that process starts in early childhood, in the first few years of life. Uh, and it means that a lot of kids who grow up in adverse circumstances when they arrive in, in kindergarten, um, they often have a lot of uh, challenges um, seating at school. And I think that a lot of our schools uh, don't right now have the tools, the strategies, the mechanisms in place to help support those kids. Uh, and instead, I think the tool that we often use with those kids is, is discipline, punishment. Uh, we look at them rather rather than you know, as the product of uh, difficult early environments, we look at them as behavior problems. Uh, and the main tool that we have is, is time to kind of change their behavior through punishment. Um, and I think that's really where the role of, of school psychologist comes in, that I think effective school, school psychologists are the people who often um, interact with those kids uh, and have an opportunity to address their needs and their struggles uh, in a more appropriate way through the lens of psychology. I talk a lot in, in this book and in my previous book, How Children Succeed, about um, what economists and psychologists sometimes call non-cognitive skills, things like grit, curiosity, conscientiousness, self-control, optimism. Um, and there's, in education, there's this the really interesting ongoing debate and discussion about what these skills and capacities are and how they're formed, what we as educators can do to address them. Um, but one of the things that, that, that often strikes me about these skills when I'm in conversations about them with educators is that, you know, to psychologists, I think they, they another way to understand them is just as, as mental health. You know, that, that kids who are able to persist uh, and bounce back from setbacks, they're kids with, you know, who, who are, are not hindered by psychological struggles. Um, and so I think the role of, I, I think often in schools, um, the problems of those kids are, are considered to be just the, the um, job of school psychologists to address. But in fact, I think while school psychologists uh, can play an important role it has to go beyond school psychologists. It has to be um, the, the real way, I think, to create uh, a situation in the school that is positive and conducive to success for a lot of kids who have grown up in university. Is to think more broadly about the environment in the school um, and to think about how we, uh, as, as educators, as administrators, and as psychologists, can affect that environment. So, to now start to actually answer your question, I talk in the book about two particular toolboxes that I think that educators can use. Uh, I don't think it's, we should look at this as sort of two separate and mutually exclusive models. Instead, I think that there are two toolboxes that any educator can use, and ideally they're using both at the same time. And one toolbox is about uh, relationships and connectedness. The other toolbox is about pedagogy, and particularly about challenge. So the toolbox that has to do with relatedness um, and, and connection and relationship, um, that is based on the psychological research that what is most motivating to kids, especially kids who grow up in adverse circumstances, is uh, that sense of belonging, of connectedness, uh, of relatedness with their peers and with the adults uh, who are uh, interacting with them, um, whether that's teachers or parents or school psychologists or anyone else. Um, and so y'all are psychologists, I don't need to explain that research to you. You know uh, that there's a deep research base explaining how important those relationships and those connections are to kids. Uh, but I think the reality is that in a lot of school situations, um, kids who are struggling, uh, who come from difficult backgrounds, don't have that sense of connectedness, don't have that sense of relatedness. And uh, there's a lot in the way that we organize our schools, the messages that we send to kids who are struggling, that often uh, makes it more difficult for them to feel a sense of belonging, uh, rather than easier for them to feel a sense of belonging. And then the other toolbox that I talk about has to do with challenge. Um, and that I think another deep sort of intrinsic psychological motivation that people have, children have, 
uh, and especially I think children who are growing up in adversity have, is the need to feel competent, to feel challenged, to feel that, that the, the adults around us have high expectations for us, believe that we can accomplish great things, believe that we can change, and grow, um, and are sending us the message that we can get better at things when we take on real challenges. Again, I think there is a lot in school environments right now uh, that send the opposite message to kids, especially kids who are struggling and who are coming from adverse backgrounds. But when we can create environments within a school that send those um, so-called growth mindset messages, that send the message to kids um, that you can take on deep, big challenges and overcome them um, and accomplish them, that not only, I think, is an effective uh, educational technique, but it is also, I think, an effective psychological technique. In, in deep and intrinsic way, um, gives kids the message that I can accomplish something, I can do better, uh, and that tends to make kids much more motivated, much more connected with their education. Yeah, I, I have a, um, a thought about what you're saying because sometimes what happens when we have kids that are struggling in their classrooms with the curricular or academic expectations, um, the teacher or, or someone will refer that child to us so that um, whether it's, you know, if, well, whatever's going on, if the child can't seem to focus or can't, it's just not, you know, kind of checking the boxes and going along towards the academic goals, those students are referred to us. And then traditionally, we come in and we'll either, um, besides having a relationship with the child, but we, we also may go into the classroom and observe and, um, and try to determine, well, what is the behavior that is negatively impacting this child's learning? And then what is the function of that behavior? It's a very, um, you know, a behavioralist approach to trying to, determine what is the one thing that we can um, change to help the child reach the curricular goals. And I think that's what you were saying in the beginning um, of, of your talking, that um, it's not exactly the same as punishment, but it's still not addressing um, the adversity or the, or the, the internal uh, struggles that this child m may be having that make the curricular goals unimportant or un connect, unrelated to, to what they're, what's going on with them. It's just, it's such a complicated um, thing that's happening. And I think teachers feel that frustration too because they're being judged often on whether they can get their class um, from, you know, this point, the zero point of knowledge towards, <laughs> towards those academic goals to, you know, at least 75 or 80 percent of that material. Um, what are your thoughts on how together we can figure this out? You know, I, because I agree that we want to nurture um, a growth mindset in these kids. So we want to say it, it's okay that it's hard. It's okay that you're making mistakes. It's okay that it's frustrating. And we want to encourage that resilience and that grit. But we still have to help them get, you know, check off those boxes. And so. How are, what are your thoughts about um, maybe the common core or these, these learning standards that we're, we're so married to in our schools um, and, and just grading in general? Do you have any thoughts on how that could be changed to help support the non-cognitive you know, skills, these, these really important character skills that we're trying to also teach kids? Sure. Um, so I want to address that question, but I want to address more broadly so what, what talking about and, and I think you know I think there are two strategies when we're when you are intervening with kids who are uh, going through struggles of any kind academic or psychological or both um, and one is a short-term intervention where we're looking specifically at the behavior that is not working and saying like what kind of uh, often using behaviorist techniques what can we do differently and I think actually that you know that is a that is uh, there's a real role for that kind a real place for that kind of intervention um, some of what is holding kids back is just, you know, not knowing the kind of metacognitive, metacognitively how to change their habits and how to, how to get out of the traps that they're in uh, if they're having trouble you know, focusing on homework, if they're having trouble sitting still and, and paying attention in class. There are, I think, things that we can teach kids um, and, and, you know, incentives and disincentives can help with that to try to shape their behavior. Um, but one of the things that I, I draw on in helping children 
succeed. He used the research by uh, DC and Ryan, their self-determination theory, that finds that, that those sorts of uh, external motivational forces, um, the, the, the uh, positive and negative reinforcement, that those tend to work in the short term and in, in small ways, but they tend to be less effective, especially with kids who are growing up in adversity, uh, if we want to really, in a deep way, sort of change their uh, their behavior over the long term and, and beyond just changing their behavior, change their motivation, change their feeling, change their sense of themselves as students. Uh, and so I think the role of school psychologists or educators in general also uh, can and should involve trying to find interventions that help kids in that broader way, help them feel intrinsically motivated mm -hmm. uh, to succeed in school. And what DC and Ryan talk about is these three um, prerequisites for intrinsic motivation, uh, a sense of belonging, a sense of competence, and a sense of autonomy. Um, and uh, those, I think, are, are really powerful principles. And when you think about them in terms of the most kids' experience of the school day, um, I think a lot of kids don't feel uh, any of those and aren't given the message uh, by the adults in the building um, very often that they belong, that they uh, have freedom and independence, um, and that they are good at what they're doing uh, and that they can get better at what they're doing. Um, so I think there's also a role for um, deeper sorts of interventions that try to change through shaping the environment in the classroom, shaping the environment in the school as a whole, to try to affect kids on that more intrinsic motivational level, giving them this deep sense of belonging, and connectedness, uh, of autonomy and competence, the ability to change and get better. And when we can find ways to do that, uh, both through specific psychological interventions, but also just like the way we assign homework, the way we uh, test kids, uh, the way we organize the school day and the school year, that I think is how we get to really deep sort of that helps us to be successful um, in a big way. So that's part of my answer to, to what you were talking about. But your specific question was about you know Common Core and assessment and how that plays into um, all of this. Uh, and I think that there is um, there's a lot in the way that federal education policy has developed over the past 15 years. This uh, intense focus on accountability as measured by um, standardized tests, cognitive skill that has uh, had a lot of unintended negative consequences. It's created um, two things. I think it's, it's made educators focus very much on one set of skills and kind of cognitive skills that are measured on those tests and not on the, the deeper uh, non-cognitive skills uh, that the research that I read about. It. But it's also created, I think, a, a, a narrowing of the focus of a lot of schools and, and, and a, a new level of stress to them, I, mean, I think. Um, Administrators, educators, and students uh, are often more stressed uh, than they used to be, um, in part because of some of those policies that I think has had this, this really negative effect. The one thing I will say about Common Core is that um, I'm not an expert in Common Core by any means, but a lot of the educators who I most respect, who I wrote about, uh, who I interviewed and wrote about, um, think that there's a, a great potential in Common Core to change the way that um, the kids are learning, to focus. Uh, in, not just on, on kind of narrow and short-term educational goals, but to focus on bigger and broader uh, educational um, outcomes and to, to make kids or to, to steer kids toward a kind of learning that is deeper um, and more involved. And more deep. So if that's the case, if we can figure out a way to, to uh, use Common Core to push kids uh, into that kind of deeper learning, a deeper engagement with with the subjects that they're studying, I think that's um, an enormously positive, can be an enormously positive. Mm -hmm. Very cool. And I think it's so important, um, you know, that you're here talking with us about some of these concepts because as school psychologists often I find that we're a little bit separate from the teachers and the admin. Um, for example, a lot of us are going through kind of our opening week activities of professional development and that sort of thing before students arrive and oftentimes I find that you know the educators, the, the teachers, the admin um, staff will be in trainings and they'll say oh that's not super relevant to you as a school psychologist so you can go back to your office and organize your counseling files or something like that like we're not really included but I'm hearing a lot of these 
buzzwords, you know, that you're talking about grit and growth mindset that educators are so, you know, are really getting excited about and getting interested in about. And I think it's important that as school psychologists, we key up, up, up with that type of stuff and involve ourselves um, with that, um, even though sometimes people think that for some reason, people think that you know we're we're doing our testing and we can be left alone and we don't need to go to these PDs um, to learn this stuff. But I think that it's important and we we need to know what's going on in the schools and and we can certainly support all these things that you're talking about. So yeah, yeah I mean I think I think that the the role of student psychology is I mean, that's mostly what I've been writing about in the last two books. And I think it's this, this largely overlooked um, uh, area in that most educators are not paying enough attention to um, how students feel. Um, and, and that, you know, I think a lot of us, when we hear that, think of like, OK, that's some nice sort of touchy feeling stuff to have once kids have learned the basics. But in fact, what, what researchers uh, are discovering, what I think a lot of psychologists already know, is that those two things are deeply intertwined, that a prerequisite for, for um, students to become engaged and connected to people in a way that's going to make them academically successful is for them to feel um, uh, psychologically okay, feel that sense of belonging, feel that sense of confidence. Uh, and, and that is not something that is just going to be about, you know, counseling once a week. That, although that certainly can play a role, that's also going to be something that um, teachers and administrators uh, are having an effect on every day in terms of how they teach, how they talk to you, what kind of uh, a discipline systems in place, um, how uh, how work is assessed, how homework is assigned, all of those things are some psychological messages to students every day. Um, and so I, I think of, of, uh, an educational realm where school psychologists are involved uh, in thinking through all of those things and not just thinking about counseling and testing uh, off in some room down the hall, uh, that I think is going to lead to a much more uh, a student, a school environment that's much more conducive to students. Yeah, that makes me think of. I pulled this quote um, from from your book, so I'm sorry to quote at you, but I'm just going to read it uh, because it it describes that that motivation. Um, intrinsic motivation piece that you're talking about. It's you wrote. It was also clear that certain pedagogical pedagogical techniques that work well in math or history are ineffective when it comes to character strengths. No child ever learned curiosity by filling out curiosity worksheets. Hearing lectures on perseverance doesn't seem to have much impact on the extent to which young people persevere. I really like that because, again, to me it's a little bit about that tension um, between, you know, what teachers want. Teachers want to know that what they're doing um, what they're teaching is what kids are learning. And so there is this sort of um, desire to assess everything. So if I ask a teacher now to, uh, we want to encourage growth mindset, um, then they might say, well, okay, so I'm going to have this great lesson on growth mindset and what it means and the values of mistakes, and then I'm going to give them this little self-survey assessment to see if they've learned it. Um, I think it's sort of, maybe an instinct, but also um, when it comes to these softer skills or these character strengths, um, it, it makes them feel more uh, weighty or more valuable in the eyes of the adults if, if they can sort of prove that kids are learning, learning these things or benefiting um, from them. So what I wonder about that is from from everything you've researched and read, um, and and how you discussed before about incentive programs and how how that sometimes undermines intrinsic motivation. What which approach for, um, and I guess not the relationship piece, but in just terms of getting or helping kids find um, that motivation to learn the the math or the history, what, do you, what kinds of programs did you find most valuable or, or, or most, and were they very different from sort of traditional or were they more about individual teachers or school cultures? What did you notice in all of your research? 
One of the things that I tried to do in helping someone succeed, which is a little bit of a distinction from my earlier work, is rather than try to um, identify certain programs uh, and interventions that I thought were, were you know, sort of perfect that everyone could emulate. Um, instead, I was looking at lots of different types of programs and interventions, some school-wide, some classroom-specific, and some just sort of individual repository uh, by teachers, um, with, with the philosophy that um, Actually, there are no sort of silver bullets. There are no perfect programs that work in every school. And that what's more helpful to teachers and educators uh, is to uh, try to understand this research as a whole and look for broader principles about what works um, and take that into uh, have that be something that any individual educator uh, or anyone working with kids can take into their own practice. Um, so. So again, I, I sort of go back to those two toolboxes, uh, the toolbox of challenge and the toolbox of, of you know, belonging and connectedness. Uh, and I think that there are there are lots of different ways that individual educators um, convey that. So just to start with the, the belonging toolbox. Um, you know, some of it, I think, is just just about the way that uh, teachers and administrators talk to kids. You know, the way that they uh, send messages to those kids from the first moment those kids go to school. Even before that, in terms of you know, letters and things that are sent home, um, I don't think we think enough right now about how much we're going to be um, I think a lot of educators feel like it's not their responsibility to make to give students a sense of belonging, um, even that it's you know sort of a sign of weakness uh, to focus on those things, uh, and that, that it won't you know, make kids tough enough if we make them feel welcome and uh, warm and connected and invited in the classroom. Um, but I think there are lots of ways on any individual teacher can convey that to their students. I think there are also, you know, I write about some programs, um, some sort of peer group mentoring programs, um, like one called Becoming a Man that's in Chicago, uh, like this uh, institution called Crew in Expeditionary Learning School, which I write about again in public um, that create um, groups of, you know, 8 to 15 students uh, who meet on a weekly or a daily basis, um, often with a, a teacher or a counselor, um, and just talk, you know, talk about what's going on in school, talk about what's going on at home. And a lot of the kids who I spoke to uh, said that this was the institution uh, that gave them a sense of belonging and connectedness. Uh, and, and certainly it was the place they felt most of a sense of belonging in school. To so some of them, it was the place where they felt most of a sense of belonging uh, in, in life in general. Um, and that, I think, we can't underestimate, especially for kids who are growing up in difficult circumstances who often don't have that place where they feel that sense of connection uh, at home or in their community. Um, we can't underestimate how important uh, that is for, for kids. It makes them want to show up at school. It makes them feel connected to their institution in a way that um, that is very difficult, I think, to create without that. Um, and then, Again, to talk about the other toolbox, to talk about the, the, the challenge toolbox. Um, some of the programs that I found most, well, again, I'll say that, that I think that is something that individual teachers can do, um, that they can find ways in the classroom to uh, engage students more, to have students participate more in class, to work in smaller groups, uh, to have more autonomy in the classroom, to have more of a sense of choice in how homework works, projects are taken on, to work on longer term projects to um, uh, work on projects where there's a lot of um, revision, where you don't just sort of have your one assignment and get it marked and then throw it out, but instead you're working on something, getting feedback, getting you know, failing, uh, and overcoming those failures. That uh, process, I think, for students is uh, not only a good way to learn academic material, but it's also, I think, psychologically resonant. It gives them a sense that you can bounce back from uh, failures that they can overcome difficulties. Uh, and even if you know they're doing that on a, on a history project, that then gives them this, this growth mindset message, which can translate to lots of other subjects and lots of other um, uh, moments in life. Um, and so, so I, I think that that is a toolbox that individual teachers can use um, in, an, in an improvising sort of way. But I write about some uh, school-based programs, including these expeditionary learning schools uh, and deeper learning schools uh, in general, that I think are taking a really um, important and interesting approach to how subjects get taught, that 
try uh, in a very um, organized and thoughtful way to figure out how to um, engage kids in, in deeper learning, how to get them to work on um, complicated uh, long-term projects that sometimes last for months, um, and how to how to include elements of, of frustration and failure and struggle in those assignments with the recognition that um, for students overcoming those frustrations uh, and dealing with those struggles is uh, psychologically important uh, as well as academically important. Um, and so to my mind, you know, what this suggests is that is that the right way to think about helping kids in the psychological realm um, is sometimes very different than the tools that we're using. I think we tend to think of this as something that, that is just about counseling, is just about something that certain uh, people in the building are doing at certain times of the day. Um, but instead, I think what the research suggests is that in ways that we can help kids on a psychological level, um, that those things are happening throughout the day. And they have to do with you know, how we assign homework, they have to do with how we assess kids' work. Um, and so I think a, a broader uh, approach to, to student psychology, ideally led by school psychologists, is what's going to make um, the building a more positive place for more uh, psychological yeah. I'm just going to adjust my ball. So please go ahead and ask your next question. Okay. Well, I just want to echo that. I completely agree that I think school psychologists can play such an important role at that tier one level of, um, you know, having opportunities for kids to get together in groups and talk and having, um, you know, push-in lessons with whole groups, encouraging, you know, that, that positive school culture of we support each other and our, our end goal is not, uh, you know, straight A's on the report card necessarily, but um, challenging ourselves and, and taking steps towards getting better. I think we as school psychologists have um, an important um, place in that at the tier at the tier one level, at which often I think unfortunately is um, less prioritized in some buildings as tier two and, and tier three. And going with tier one, I could see this interwoven into like a PBIF model or something, and then going up to tier two. I've heard of schools that have, you know, meetings where they talk about kids who are struggling, and they have a staff member sort of assigned to each kid, like who has a good relationship with this kid, who can build a good relationship with this kid. But I've heard of that kind of like intentional connectedness building thing. I think that doing more of that could also be good, like really mindfully helping kids form connections with staff and making sure that there is someone in this building who genuinely likes that kid, you know, and works with them and they know it and they build a relationship. I think those would be really good things to do. Mm -hmm. uh, Rebecca, you do the next one? Yeah, so, um, well, I have a question that's not on my list here, but I'm just really curious. Uh, after you completed this second book and you were focused more on um, kids coming out of adverse situations in their communities or in, at, at home, were you left feeling less hopeful, more hopeful, or about the same? <laughs> um, great question. And, and I think, unfortunately, the answer uh, mean hopefulness is that it depends on the day. Um, I think there's, there's a lot in this research uh, that does make me hopeful. I mean, I, I think that the, the science, um, our understanding of how adversity works in the lives of kids and what kind of interventions can help um, uh, mitigate the effects of adversity and do things for kids who are growing up in difficult circumstances, we know a lot more than we used to. Um, there are exciting and important uh, experiments and innovations preventing happening all over the country. Um, so in that sense, I feel really heartened uh, by some of the directions that things are going. At the same time, in my more pessimistic moments, um, you know, I have to recognize that um, the interventions that I find most promising are very small uh, when compared with the size of the problem. There are um, millions of kids who are growing up in poverty, uh, millions who are growing up in, in deep poverty. I think there's a number in the book. I don't have it at my fingertips, but I think it's 8 million kids uh, who are growing up in families that are not only below the poverty line, but that are 50 at 50% of the poverty line or below, which is a, uh, an income of uh, like 
twelve thousand dollars for a family of four. Boy, that's eight million kids, uh, and that is uh, a level of adversity that I think we, we do not have a lot of um, tools to deal with uh, right now in our social service agencies, in our schools, in our counseling centers. Uh, and these kids, I think, need an enormous amount of help. We need to really rethink how, as a society, we are addressing the needs of, of, of those kids and, and kids even with less extreme, um, uh, in less extreme circumstances, but who are still facing the adversity. Um, and so, yeah, so I go back and forth. I, I do think that there's a lot that we can do. There's a lot that we know that we can, that we should be doing, that we can do differently than we're doing right now. I don't, I, I often don't. I often worry that we don't have uh, um, the political will right now, the will as a, as a society, to take this on as a, as a public responsibility. Say that the lives of kids who are growing up in diversity uh, are the responsibility not just of um, their parents or their teachers, but of all of us. It's really mm -hmm. a national, a community responsibility, not a national responsibility. Um, so my hope is that um, the the push from books like mine uh, and from the successful interventions that I write about are going to start to change um, our opinion not only on, uh, about what's possible uh, and how much that we can help kids who are growing up in university, um, but also push us in terms of thinking about whose responsibility it is and have more of us feel like this is my job and that helps all. That's great. Oh, thank you for that. That's and and I think I want to thank you just for your book. That's my feeling about it. That um, parents are reading it and communities are reading it. And um, as much of a challenge as we have, as many challenges as we have ahead of us in public education, um, I I feel hopeful. I feel hopeful because this is the conversation. This is. Uh, the national conversation around education, and that in itself to me is very hopeful. That's great. Um, and, uh, you know, I wish that there was a way that we could, you know, prevent the, the trauma and, you know, make sure kids get the secure attachment and all that good stuff that, that can lead to a more positive outcome. But sometimes we're intervening in the moment. So I guess the final question is um, you mentioned teachers that aren't really trained in handling conflicts can set kids off further. And further escalate it. So if you had like a, if you, you know, we've we've all seen this, you know, staff who kind of set the kids off and really make things worse, and that relationship is so in the toilet, you know. So if you had a word of advice for a teacher who was setting kids off in, unintentionally, what would you say? Well, uh, to my mind, the most in, most useful tool for uh, for helping a teacher like that, um, and I think that's a lot of teachers. I mean, I think. The reality is that teaching kids who are growing up in adversity was really hard, you know, and the kids who are growing up in adversity uh, and, and have the kind of, you know, highly fired up fight or flight response that comes from growing up in adversity, they're very difficult to manage. Uh, they often you know, behave in ways that are really disruptive in the classroom, um, and that's what makes it very difficult to teach. So I, I don't, you know, I don't want to blame teachers for having that, uh, for taking that personally, for having that kind of action. But I do believe that if... Uh, educators um, understand this research, understand uh, the psychological research, the neuro, uh, neurobiological research, understand how adversity affects kids on a neurological level, affects the way that they develop, affects the way that they behave in school. Um, it, I think it has the real potential to change the way those um, teachers think in that moment, uh, that your first instinct is not like this student is out to get me, um, and the student is, 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 you know, to not personalize it, to not think that this student is doing this just to make my life uh, difficult, um, but to understand that these students are reacting in ways that are totally predictable, uh, that make sense in the in the context uh, in which they're living, that they have, you know, these, that growing up in adversity has these, these neurobiological effects, that it does make it, um, you know, it creates adaptations in the brain and in the stress response system. That make kids more likely to, to you know, react intensely to provocation. It's more difficult for them to sit still and to concentrate. Uh, if we understand it, I think on that biological level, um, you know, the downside of that is that it can make us fatalistic. It can make, make us just think like, okay, we don't have to try to help those kids. They're they're a write off, um, and that's absolutely not what I think we should do with that research. But instead, I think it, it, 
leads us to say, like, this is a, uh, a predictable reaction to the environment in which this child is living. If we can change that environment, uh, and we as teachers, as educators, as school psychologists have a role in changing that, that environment, this child will do better. This child will, will behave differently. Um, and so that, that, you know, doesn't necessarily make the behavior any easier to take, but it makes it, I think, easier to uh, depersonalize it, to understand that this is, uh, this is not, you know, an attack on you as a teacher. Uh, it is instead a reaction to the environment in which the child is, is existing. Um, and I think when teachers understand that, they behave differently. They're more likely to dial confrontations down rather than dial them up. They're more look, likely to look for interventions that, that aren't just about uh, punishment and exclusion and taking kids out. Um, you know, it doesn't mean that we're, you, you have to excuse bad behavior. It doesn't mean you need to let kids run wild. Uh, in fact, you know, the reality is these kids need lots of help in, in learning how to regulate themselves and their behavior and their thoughts and their emotions. Um, but I think it gives teachers a different uh, frame to put around that behavior and those reactions by kids. And it, and it potentially starts to give them a different toolbox, a different set of tools that they can use. And I think, I, all that said, I still think the teachers in that cir circumstance, even when they get the science and they understand what's going on for these students, they still need help. You know, they still need um, coaching and support and information. Um, and I think that school psychologists can play a great role in that. Um, you know, I, I think one of the things that I write about in this book is the importance of coaching, that, that you know, parents, teachers, uh, uh, pre-K teachers, they all benefit from this kind of coaching. Um, and I think school psychologists are in an especially good um, uh, position to provide that kind of, of coaching and support to teachers to say, like, this is what's going on in this moment when you and the student are in the midst of this great competition. Here's another approach you might want to try. Um, I think teachers are, are actually really uh, eager for that kind of input. Um, and if they can get it from school psychologists, that's, that's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. I just want to quickly add to that. I was lucky enough to be at the Grit and Imagination Conference um, a few weeks ago at the University of Pennsylvania with Dr. Martin Seligman and other Angela Duckworth and Scott Bray Coffin. It was wonderful and the um, focus was on grit and imagination but also positive psychology and education or positive education and Dr. Seligman said that um, as he was um, studying and researching with teachers how to um, incorporate more positive emotions in the classroom, he, he found that one of the most helpful things about the interventions was that it reduced teacher burnout. So when teachers were focused on, um, on noticing these positive emotions in their students and cultivating them, and so whether if it was, hu if it was humor and, and validating sort of, you know, your class clown instead of, um, you know, maybe sending him out of the room or whatever. But the if, when the teachers were focused on the value of positive emotions and the value of these character traits, they felt better, and that changed everything. So just to go along with what you were saying, I think that's great. Absolutely. Very cool. Um, and then also, um, I thought you made a really good point about how that trauma and poverty and all the stressors um, is, is changing that behavior, changing them, um, how, how these kids are developing. And it just makes me think of, um, I think there's a court case out of California where um, it was determined that the, the ongoing poverty and stressors that some of these really low-income families and children are subjected to um, was essentially considered a disability, that those students that were subjected to that would be entitled to all those rights and protections um, with that IEP. Um, uh, you know, then our, our other, our ADHD kids or our learning disability kids and whatnot. So I think, yeah, that, that's a really good point that it's not it's a function of, of everything going on around them and it's essentially a disability when, when you're looking at it like that. So. Um, but thank you so much for coming on and chatting with us. Um, we really appreciate it and I think that everyone learned a lot. Um, and I just wanted to, um, first off, Rebecca, any comments? And if anybody out there watching has any comments and want to um, tweet us or, you know, 
now's the time because we're wrapping up. Yeah. But um, and I also wanted to make note that um, we had a little, a couple of videos going out over the summer in our during our hi hiatus, looking at just how to be more efficient at some of the things that we do on a daily basis using Google Forms to write faster evaluations and monitor IP goals and um, some template use and things like that. So check that out if you um, get a chance. So um, we were excited to um, be making those. Any last comments, Rebecca? No comments. I think some uh, of us are back to work and probably still um, at, at our desks. And some of us are still on vacation and taking advantage of that. So maybe we can repost this um, at our regular time so that we'll make sure we get it out there to as many people as possible because it was a really great conversation. Thank you so much, Paul, for, for chatting with us. Great. Well, thank you for the invitation. Uh, and thanks for a great conversation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.